come on, man. We practice this. So, when one morning I found myself sitting on the floor of a witch doctor's hut deep in West Africa, sharpening the witch doctor's knife on some rocks before cutting myself to deliberately draw blood, cutting myself on the arm, so I could prove to the witch doctor that the knife protection talisman that he had made for me was not, in fact, worth the 20 pounds that I'd paid for it. This was a moment, this is probably the first moment, age 25, that I realized that actually some of the stuff I do in my life is not normal. I'm Ed Bateman, this is a story about my first trip to Africa. On drums, we have the Big Mac. Oh yeah, and on guitar, Niwo Tsumbu. So in the previous episode, I told you about how I'd recently met modern Jai Sissoko, Cora player, Senegalese Cora player in Bristol, and he invited me to Senegal. So I went, I bought my ticket. I, I didn't do any research. Off I went to Africa. I flew to Banjul, Gambia, which if, you, if you're traveling to the south of Senegal, it's easier to fly to Gambia. Geographically, it's just closer to the south. So, and we would cross the border by road. So Modu sent his young brother, 15 year old brother, to pick me up at the airport. I got off the plane, you know, I'm dressed for the English winter. It's hot as hell, everyone in the airport is kind of in a baggage claim. They've all been drinking on the plane, they jump off, they no idea what's going on, the heat hits them. There's all this kind of pushing and shoving by the, by the baggage section. I get through security, and there's like people just grabbing me by one arm, trying to pull me one way, people grabbing me by the other arm, pulling me the other way, trying to get me to change money or, or buy them something or get a taxi or something like that. It's chaos. And I find Modu's brother and he's got a sign with my name on. And I wasn't even sure he spoke English because he, he wasn't really speaking much at the top. And there was like, I didn't know if any of these people were with him. And we so we get out there, we get outside the airport into a taxi. We jump in, we put bags in, and suddenly there's all this shouting in Wolof, the local language, and um, we have to jump out, and the same thing happens again. It's all kind of, it's all pretty chaotic. Then uh, finally, after about four hours of changing taxis, crossing borders, we get to Ziginshaw, Senegal, in the south of Senegal. So the first few days, staying at Modu's house, his brother lives next door, they've got identical houses. His brother is a Cora player, well-known Cora player, Seku Keita. What I didn't know is that, in fact, in, in Senegal and West Africa, they have this tradition of griots. Griots are, you know, go, it's a, tr a tradition that goes back 700 years. They're a dynasty of family musicians, so before there was, before there were mobile phones, before there was Wi-Fi, before there was all these kinds of connections. It was the job of the griots to pass on the news. So if the king had a message, he would tell the griots, the griots go out and sing it to people, or they put it into a song. Any stories from history get turned into song. That's how, that's how things get passed on. So there's a, communication would happen a lot through these griots and it meant that because they were born into a family of musicians it's basically they start playing from the age of five you know some of some of my friends in that family they you know they're basically beaten by their grandfather to play the kora at the age of five forced into it so so they're pretty good at it
So I'm crashing at, at Mo staying at Modu's house for the first few days. And we haven't really ventured out far. We're, we're in the town. There's a, there's a girl who's coming to the house every day, cooking and cleaning for all these guys. While, while they're just kind of uh, chilling out, lying down, hanging out all day. And I was always thinking, why is this woman coming? I wasn't sure if she was working there or if she was a friend or a relation. While these guys are just kind of doing nothing. So after a few days, I saw her cooking. So I got up and started peeling some carrots to help her out. And as soon as I got up to start peeling some carrots, all these guys who pretty much just been lying down, chilling out for the last three days, suddenly jumped onto the feet and like, no, Ed, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. And I was like, it's cool, I'm, you know, I'm happy to do this. Just peel a few carrots. And, and actually, it was good, because like, by the end of my trip there, it, it was, so the, this this girl cooking, she's a, turns out she was a sister of a guy who would have become my friend, um, Matar and Jong drummer who you're going to hear about. But it's like by the end of the trip there, I noticed that she was actually comfortable enough to like, after she's done some cooking, just give all the dirty pots to the guys, take them outside and say, hey, you go and clean this. And they'd actually do it. So it seemed like the dynamic slightly changed a bit, which was cool. Because Senegal's a Muslim country, I thought there was no alcohol in the whole country. I thought it was illegal. And after about three or four days, we go out to a gig at a place called Alliance Francais. And the Alliance, they're set up all over West Africa, other parts of Africa as well. And basically French funded arts institutions where, uh, where they put concerts on regularly. So it turns out that Modu, all of his, all of his brothers and uncles are like the most famous Chora players in the in the whole southern region of the country revered his uncle is Solo Sissoko, the first guy to ever play the Chora standing up. Now you might think that's not very revolutionary, but it was a tr traditional instrument. So he played with percussion and voices, and suddenly he was the one who, who stood up, played standing up, and put it with bass guitar, drum kit modern instruments completely change the sound and he was incredibly influential on a lot of musicians and basically a whole a hero in the southern region of the country so I went to this gig and I met Sergio Sissoko one of Modu's uncles a great chorus player and they had some gigs coming up there's a festival called Abeni Festival where the family play every year. And basically there's six different bands in the immediate family. There's Sajo Sissoko, he's got his whole repertoire. Solo Sissoko, Charlie Philly Sissoko. There's Seko Keita, Modern Jai Sissoko, Adam Afune Sissoko. And then they also all come together where they have the Jali Kunda Sissoko. Jali Kunda. Jali means Krio in Mandinka, the language they speak and Kunda is house, so a Jali Kunda, if you go to a town in Senegal or in West Africa where they speak Mandinka and say, say to the taxi driver, take me to the Jali Kunda, that's take me to the house of the Grio, and you'll be able to find some musicians there. And these are musicians who've been basically for the last 700 years being a, being a part of the lo local culture and the local history. So, the good thing for me is they have, in this band, in this family, immediate family, six different bands, loads of chorus players, no bass player. So there I am, age 22, this white guy from Devon, suddenly networking with some of the most revered musicians in the whole southern region of the country. So. Sajo's teaching me his repertoire, he's teaching me solos, repertoire, Seku stuff, modus, the whole family band stuff, and Jali Philly's material as well. And in three weeks, 
I learn the entire repertoire of six bands and we do the first gig. A lot of the gigs we do will be four hours long or five hours long, sometimes with no break unless there's a power cut. Pretty challenging. Great for the stamina and it's like everyone in the band, there might be 10, 12 of us, all in this immediate family. Um, apart from me, standing out. So it was a great experience uh, developing my ear, developing, you know, being able to retain repertoire, but also being able to learn stuff and be able to follow musicians. And even if I don't know what song's coming up, when it starts, I've got about two bars to make it look like I know what I'm doing. Otherwise, people will figure out that I don't. So I had to develop that skill. Let's change the groove up. Let's go to a Senegalese and Balakh style groove. Go A flat and C minor. Yeah, one, two, three, four. So in Senegalese music, the relationship with, between the drums and the bass is really interesting. There's a lot of this. There's a, there's a lot of times when it's not so necessary to play on beat one. So the beats go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Which is so different to um, a lot of styles of music and a lot of other styles of African music. So you really lock in. So when I'm on stage, I sit right or stand right next so I can see the drummer's right foot. So I know I can anticipate where he's, if I don't know a song, I can anticipate where he's going to put that kick. And you just you learn to kind of feel what people are going to play and how you can lock into that. So when we were on stage that first gig, Sajo taught me all these songs and he had incredible ability. It was like he'd be tapping his foot, tapping out 4-4, four, four, whilst playing a pretty intricate syncopated chorus line while singing me a bass line at the same time with a completely different rhythm and I'd be like, wow, how is he doing this? He's like a superhuman musical force. So he taught me everyone's repertoire. And then when we got on stage, there was one of the songs I learned called, called uh, Concobar. Concobar is a traditional, traditional griot tune. And then suddenly I, I hear him playing the chorus line. I recognize it. But as soon as the drums kick in, I realize I've actually learned the song, feeling it uh, in a completely different part of the bar. So it's like, if I feel this song, for example, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. If you've learned a song and it's like, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, feeling it on the offbeat, it's really hard to unlearn if you're feeling something in the wrong part. So I was like, I couldn't follow this song at all, and I was like, I couldn't feel the beat. I, I'm watching people dance. Just watching dance, seeing where they're putting their feet, trying to follow where is the beat. It's a nightmare. Even to this day, it's still hard for me to feel that because I've locked into my brain feeling, feeling it one way. So it's great. You know, I was playing it playing so much with these guys. Then there was a festival in the town. There's a band called Omar Penn and Super Jamino. Really famous Zambalak band from Dakar, from the capital. And this band was playing. Afterwards, I went to a bar. And I saw them there and they, the backing band were just in there playing a Charlie Parker tune. You know, they jumped up on stage and sat in, they were playing some jazz. I was like, I started chatting to them after, the, after they were playing, knowing that these are some kind of famous influential musicians from Dakar. And while I'm at the table, someone walks up to the table and says to them, oh, this bass player, he's the best bass player in Ziggenshaw. I think, oh, how does this guy even know me? You know, I've only been there for like a month. And about two minutes later, no joke, 
someone else comes up to the table and says, oh, this bass player, he's a top bass player in Ziggenshaw. And, and the band, Super Jamno's band, like, okay. They say, oh, well, you should come to Dekar and play with us. So I say to Modu and all the guys, oh, I'm gonna go to Dakar. So Ziggenshaw is in the south of the country and there's like, there's been kind of minor amounts of uh, rebel activity, rebels who don't want to be part of the north. Yeah, separatists. And so some people in the north think that in the south it's really dangerous and the rebels are gonna kill you. And then people in the south think Dakar is this really dangerous city, yeah? So Modu's like, oh, don't go to... And bear in mind, Modu lives in England, in Bristol. He's like, he's like, oh, don't go to Dakar. They're going to kill you. They're going to beat you up. They're going to steal your money. And you're going to have to phone me up crying to get money for the, the trip home. And I was like... I was like, yeah, don't worry, you know, I'll be fine. Off I go. So I take a taxi, and it's a bush taxi, which is like about 12 hours. You travel through Gambia, it's a pretty tough journey. And I start, you know, I, I meet Dudu Conroy. Dudu Conroy is a guitarist of Super Jamino, and, and he's been part of the, really part of the Mbala. You know, the distinctive sound. He played on a lot of those early records. Top guy. I go up there for a bit and I come back and we record an album in the Casamance, no, in Gambia. And Sajo says to me, who books your gigs in England? And I say, oh, I do that. And he says, oh, can you book a gig for, for us? Can you book a tour? And I say, yeah, sure. No worries. But I haven't realised at all what's involved and how complicated that is. I don't know anything about visas. So, now I'm back in England. I start making a promo pack, which is like... One one terrible quality image that I found. An email with a little bio, and I'm start emailing that, emailing that out to venues across the country. And I ended up booking a 25 date tour of England and Sweden, and with a load of workshops as well. So the band come over, or well, before they come over, I start, uh, I realise, oh, you need to get visas, you need to get work permits. Now, I'm not able to get work permits because you need to be a Home Office licensed sponsor, which I obviously am not, and I, I, I don't meet any of the financial criteria to be able to apply, so I think, oh no, what am I going to do? And then, I, then somehow I find a guy, someone sees a, a gig I do and, and um, books another one of my bands, and. I'm basically able to buy buy some work permits, sort of unofficially. Do the visa applications, get these guys into the country. Now, remember how I said in the last episode how I, you know, ended up having to drive everyone and not having a chauffeur by the time I was 18. On this tour, we did over 5,000 miles in my car. My Ford Mondeo diesel estate. Before one day, we were arriving in the north of England, in uh, in Yorkshire, and just bang, the suspension snaps in half on the car. We've got the band, we've got the drum kit, amplifiers, and suddenly we have to kind of drag half of the car for the last last few miles coming into this into this town we have to leave the car there and get towed back down with all the gear and basically this tour it's my first time I've ever put a tour on I'm inexperienced some of the gigs playing us a guaranteed fee some of us are playing a percentage of tickets so we don't know how much it's gonna be until the end we don't know uh, 
um, how much money we're going to end up with. So the guys are like always asking me for money, you know, say, oh, can I get some money to buy this? And I say, okay, cool. Just advancing the money. And the guys coming from Senegal, it's like, it's like they pretty much just wanted to buy everything they could find and take it home with them and give to people. So by the end of the tour, when you know it's finally time to work out all the finances, you know I work out okay we're going to get exactly this amount, this amount each. But you've spent this much, you've spent that much. You know I didn't manage the finances very well. And and uh, yeah, so it turned out like Sarjo had spent so much money just buying hats, buying shoes, buying anything he could find, buying fancy suits and not really being kind of taken taking into account of that and everyone was so stressed out with each other because we've done over 5,000 miles being the same car we've been in, an al- in the studio done a whole album nobody was talking to anybody else everybody was angry with everyone no one wanted to be near anyone on that last gig on stage no one's even looking at each other that tour finishes. That's our first tour. The band goes back to Senegal. Me and Sarjo, we don't even say goodbye to each other. He's off to the airport. You know, the, the, the relationship between everyone in the band at this point, no one even wants to see each other. Let's go to a salsa groove, yeah? Um, in E flat, Tumbao. Salsa and one, two, three, four. Just need to kind of uplift the groove a bit there. It's getting a bit depressing. So, me and Sarjo made up on the phone. I went straight back to Senegal a month after. More touring there. We did a gig, a festival. There was a festival called, um, I guess in English it would it would translate as Festival of the Black Arts, Festival des Arts Negris or something like that in French. And uh, the f- the president Abdullah Wad, you know, he booked all these people, or you know, the festival was showing all these people like Wycliffe Jean, all these artists from around the world going to be over there. Of course, none of them turned up because the organization was so was so messed up and so backward. We did a gig. We opened for Salif Keita and Yusun Dor. But the gig was delayed by a day because the stage didn't arrive. I remember seeing an interview with the president, Abdullah Wad. And he was saying, oh, I asked my minister of culture to bring Barack Obama to do a spot at the festival. But he couldn't get Barack Obama, so I sacked him. You know, he kind of... He was, he was a pretty old guy, he's kind of going a bit senile. They had, they, had an, they had an election the next year. But you know, that gig, we're doing opening for Salif Keita in Yusundor. Broadcast. There's probably 10,000 people there at the port. It's broadcast live on RTS Senegal television network. And there's people I know in the country who are ringing me. Oh, Ed, I've seen you playing on the TV. And I'm thinking like, wow, like this, this would never happen in England, you know? It's like networking in some parts of the world. It takes a real long time to build your way up. It was, the great thing for me was in Senegal, I just went straight in. I was very fortunate, thanks to Modu and his introductions, I was going straight in with really high level musicians and shortcutted a lot of that stuff, which can happen if you arrive in a town in England, you know? I went back up to Dakar to see my friend Dudu Conoré and Super Jamino. Now, because he was such a well-known guy around the town, we go out to venues like Just For You, just for you is a bar in Senegal. They got bands on every night. Notorious venue. 
And there's an artist called Shek Lo, very famous singer there. And then when they see him in the crowd, you know, they'll point to him, invite him up on stage to do a solo. And I'm sitting there having a few beers and I'm thinking, oh man, I'd love to do a solo as well and show these people, you know, what I've got, what I can do. And so I say, oh, Dudu, I'd love to go up and do a solo. He's like, okay, no problem. He just stands up, points at the bass player, does a kind of hand signal that I guess means like swap around. And he's like, okay, go, it's fine. I say, what? And so I just walk, you know, walk up to the stage in the middle of the song. The bass player starts giving me his bass and he's like, something like, he says to me in my ear, like, fa, re minor, sol, re minor, which obviously do, re, mi, fa, so, we all know that means C, D, E, F, G. But we don't really, we don't use that, you know, in England. I know they use that in, you know, French, Italian, Spanish speaking countries. But that basically means nothing to me without having to take loads of time and figure out exactly what those notes are. So I just take his bass and I don't have perfect pitch or anything like that. You know, my ear was very much still developing at that time, but somehow by, you know, great coincidence, I just nail it straight away. My first note, I'm right in there, in this groove. And then Shekelow's playing kit. Then I like lock my groove into his bass drum pattern. And I look, you know, and then um, after the gig, he's like, oh, you are criminal bass player, you are criminal. You are Furknop. Furknop in Wolof means like good ears. And, you know, same thing happens with Orchestra Baobab, real influential band. Dudu's actually playing with them. So I go to the gig, you know, and invite me up on stage. You get to play a little bit of Orchestra Baobab. I can't exactly, I can't really put it in my kind of biog and say I played with them because it's just a couple songs. It's not like, it's not like actually being booked for the gig, but you know, pretty good experience. So that's my second time in Senegal and I come back to the UK. Then I bring back Sarjo for another tour. This time, we know what we're doing. I managed to get some out Arts Council funding. So financially it worked out much better. I got a new Ford Mondeo that would drive around in that didn't uh, snap in half halfway through or at the end. Playing with all kinds of other bands. You know, we've, after the tour when they went back, we got booked to do a gig in Zanzibar. So I was, I was currently, I was on tour in Spain, Santander, Northern Spain with Jimmy Sai Sai. Jimmy Sai Sai was a good friend of mine, actually met in Senegal. Spanish guy from Bristol. So we're doing a tour in Spain. Then this Zanzibar festival gig gets booked in for Sarjo. So I fly over to Zanzibar. It's a pretty long trip, London. So I'm, you know, I go to Spain, back to London, to Dubai, then to Dar es Salaam, then Dar es Salaam to Zanzibar. Festival pick me up from the airport and say, oh, we've got some bad news. The rest of your band isn't here. So Sarjo and Matar, they're going to be flying from, from Dakar, Senegal. But the festival's given them the wrong visas and they're not allowed on the plane. So they say, oh look, we're going to sort it out when we get them here tomorrow. Next day, the same thing happens. So they end up putting me on stage with like a local hip hop band. I do a little guest spot, I'm playing with them. So my surname's Bateman, but it doesn't always get pronounced correctly. So. The band's like, oh, we got Batman on the bass. We got Batman from England. Batman, give him some sugar. And I'm like, you know, doing a little solo or whatever. And so basically in, in Zanzibar for 40 hours, I've got to fly straight back for another gig. The band arrived in the airport just as I'm leaving the airport. They ended up going on the next day, opening for Shaggy. Mr. Boombastic, Mr. Lover Lover, just without a bass player. I fly back to London. I've got a gig at Glastonbury Festival with Backer Beyond, who do like Cameroonian pygmy music fused with Celtic grooves, vibes. And so they never actually send me any of the songs. They don't send me the set. So I get to the, I fly back to the airport, I drive to Glastonbury. So 
I arrived there in Glastonbury Festival now and I can see that I'm really starting to get ill. Something's happening. I go to the healing field, spend all my money on shiatsu. They say, look, we need to give you something to knock you out, but you've got to go on stage. So that's not going to be possible. I find back beyond the band. We go to their yurt, their teepee, where they're going to teach me the songs. By this time, I'm basically lying on the floor of their yurt, hallucinating with a fever, where the singer's like flicking ice cold water on me, trying to cool me down. And we end up doing the gig at 3 a.m. at Glastonbury Festival, just sitting on a chair, following along. Then the next day, I had to wake up, go and play with Zimbabwean band in Bristol, and the day after that, basically just go to the hospital. And it turns out I had like some kind of East African fever that I'd picked up. I auditioned for London Guildhall. I was going to do a jazz masters. I went to the audition. I didn't get accepted. I'm kind of glad I didn't because I ended up just going back to Senegal, which for learning music is sort of like, you know, it's great studying in school and tutors, but you've also got to get on the ground and, you know, absorb music and, you know, immerse yourself in it on a day by day basis. And I find that, you know, some of the jazz, people go too deep into jazz. They just end up becoming no fun in conversation. They just want to talk about scales and modes and diminished harmony and stuff. And just kind of like lose all their social skills, you know? It's like, you know? So anyway, well, you know, I didn't, they didn't accept me. I guess I wasn't jazzy enough or experienced enough. So I go back to Senegal. This is my third time there. Now my, my flight's delayed by about six hours, so I arrive in Gambia, I can't cross the border because they shut at night because of, you know, because of the rebels, I guess. Um, so I just find a local hotel, go to a bar called Shosan on the center Gambia Strip, where I know they have music and bands playing. I go down there and there's a 10 piece band playing Balakh band playing with no bass player. And Balakh is, you know, the local national style, sorry, national style in Senegal and, and Gambia. And I'm like, oh, what's up, guys? I got my bass at the hotel. And actually, I, I recognise the keyboard player because he's a distant cousin of Modu, a griot on the Gambian side. So they say, yeah, go and get your bass. So I get my bass. I set up on the stage where I'm in between the drums and the piano, so I can kind of see the drummer's right foot and the kick and feel feel that and, and vaguely kind of look at what the keyboard player is doing. I don't really play piano, but you know, see if I can figure out on his left hand what some of the, the harmony is and the chords. So basically play with this band, you know, about six or seven songs for the rest of their set. Afterwards, so they, they were called Pa Omar Jack. Pa Omar Jack. And they say, oh, look, we play here every night. Can you come back and play with us every night? So I say, all right, cool. So basically, we do a three-hour set every night. And we each get about six pounds for doing that gig, right? Now, some of the musicians, some of the musicians just come from another gig in the hotel where they get four pounds for a two-hour gig. So they're basically... We're playing from midnight till three in the morning every day. Now there's no shortage of money. It's just a singer and a manager steal it all or take it all. Maybe you know, like there's this kind of tradition in in West Africa where you know when you're on the stage, a lot of people in the crowd will come and give money to the band, show their appreciation like that. So they have this whole culture of praise singing, which is like people in the crowd will come and give money to the singer and the singer will be like, oh, yeah, the person is so wonderful, so beautiful, whatever. I imagine that's how they, you know, what the kind of thing is they're singing about. And it's like, if there's someone in the crowd who's actually really wealthy 
what they'll do is they'll actually sing their name and start seeing how cool and great and wonderful and generous they are. So they're kind of like obliged then to give money to the band. So there's loads of money flowing to the band, but it's just like the singer and manager that takes it all. A bit sad. So after seven days, after seven days, I'm playing with them every night, and I realise, you know, I'm not going to learn anything else. We're playing the same night, same songs every day. By now, I figured out how it all goes. And in in, Sen in Senegal, in Ziggenshaw, they've got gigs coming up, so I need to go and, and be there. So we do loads of great gigs. This is this is now 2012, pr presidential elections times times. So the guy Abdullah Ward, who I told you about before, there were nine or ten people, other candidates opposing him in the 2012 election. Yusun Dor was a pre presidential candidate opposing him, and the president made up a law or a rule that said, "Oh, singers are not allowed to be presidents, so he can't take part in the election." And he basically banned every single one of his opponents, apart from one, from, from competing in the election. And the one that he didn't ban beat him. So they had a new president. But it was a crazy time. Some of the gigs, some of the gigs were getting really dis disorganized. You know, we'd arrive in a town, maybe 15 piece band, and there'd be a hotel booked for the singer and no one else. You know, this is with the, the Jali Kunda band and Solo Sissoko. All kinds of arrangements and things were just like, really put, really kind of putting me off and making me lose, lose interest and, and lose my enjoyment. So I was thinking, okay, forget music. I'm done with this. I want a break. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do? What am I going to do for money? So I was like, okay, obviously I'll become a car dealer. I'll become an international car dealer. That's a logical step. Albeit for the fact that I know nothing about cars or international export business. So I'd heard that in Guinea-Bissau, another country to the south of Senegal, people said it's really kind of up, up and coming. People would like to spend a lot of money and show off there. That's that's That was the perception that the Senegalese had about Guinea-Bissau. And there's not so much, not so many businesses there, so there's more opportunities. So I was like, cool. So I took a friend of mine who I knew spoke Creole, Portuguese Creole that speak in Guinea-Bissau. We went down to Guinea-Bissau to investigate, you know, the car trade. So this is me as a 25-year-old guy thinking I'm kind of somehow be an African car dealer. Get down to Guinea-Bissau, you know, to try and figure out what kind of cars people want, make some connections with customs and, you know, and tax agents, make some contacts. But basically just spend the time drinking and having fun and going out to parties. And I was like, cool, yeah, I'm going to do some business. So I went back to Senegal, went back across the border back to Senegal. And it was time now to end my trip and go back to England. And on my way from Senegal to Gambia, the taxi driver I had, I started talking to him and he said his car, Mercedes he was driving was an import and his friend had imported it and cleared the customs. And by coincidence, his friend's uh, garage and car dealership was on the way between Senegal and Gambia Airport. So we stopped there. He introduced me to this new contact, Ishmaela Kamara, who I would later go into business with. Just before that, something I've left out, maybe after Guinea-Bissau, I had a friend, she was a 
percussionist. She was really scared of flying, really scared of flying. Terrified of being in a plane. And I'd heard about local witchcraft and juju. They have these people called called marabous. Marabous are like local witch doctors. You know, when we had one of these, the first tour with Sarjo, Sarjo was like, oh, can you send me a hundred pounds so I can kill a goat and take it to the witch doctor so we can have good luck for the tour? I was like, ah, I don't know about that. So I was like, okay, I'd heard about knife protection and accident protection and Modu, all his family wore this stuff that their grandfather got for them. So I was like, okay, cool. If I can know for 100% certainty that the knife protection works, then I can, I can buy the accident protection for my friend, give it to her, she'll never have to be scared of flying. So I said to my friend Ali Gassama, I said, oh, cool. Uh, if I can meet someone with a knife protection, try and cut them and not be able to cut them, then I'll know that this is for real and I'll buy the accident one. He was like, sure, no worries. But I, I think he, he didn't quite understand what I, what I was saying. So later that night, he turned up and he brought his witch doctor, his marabou, to the house. And he was like, oh, a witch doctor's made you a knife protection talisman belt. And I was like, oh, that's not exactly what I wanted. I just wanted to test it. But anyway, you know, he's here. So I, I put on this belt, which has this talisman in. And then suddenly the witch doctor gets out his knife and starts sawing away at my arm. I'm like, dude, like, what's, you know, what's going on here? And what they say is like, when you're wearing this knife protection, you still feel the pain of the knife, but the metal can't pierce your skin. So it works the same for bullets as well. And so Modu and all his friends, you know, they like then take his knife, they're testing out his knife, you know, chopping down some plants, they're like, yeah, this knife is sharp. And he's there cutting away at my arm, and there's no blood. So I'm like, okay, this is interesting. I didn't really want a knife protection belt, but for 20 quid, if this could stop me from ever being stabbed or shot in my life, then it's probably worth it. So I was like, cool, yeah, I'll take the knife protection, um, proceed with the construction of the accident protection for my friend. But what I really wanted to do, for absolute certainty, and I guess this is my kind of logical mind, what I needed, all I wanted to do was just wear the, wear the knife protection, try and cut myself and not be able to, then take off the knife protection, cut myself and bleed, and then I would know, okay, this, this works, 100%. So I was so in my room at Modu's house, basically sitting there cutting myself, trying to cut myself, and it's like, there's no blood, I'm like, oh. So I'm like, then I go and take, there's like someone um, fixing a satellite dish onto the top of the, onto the house. I go up and get his work knife, bring it down. I'm sitting in the room trying to cut myself, and I'm like, you know, oh, no blood. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm taking like, like scissors, uh, like scissors for cutting nails. Still can't cut myself, and I'm like, all right. I then take a, um, a razor, a shaver, pull out the razor. I'm trying to cut myself down. I'm like, whoa. So I'm like, cool. And I, I, at first, I'm a bit kind of squeamish, but then I'm like, well, look, if I've got this protection. I can't be cut. So cool. And then I, I take off the belt and I try and cut myself. I still can't draw blood. I'm like, oh, why not? I'm just trying to cut myself. So I say to the guys in the house, oh, I've taken off this knife protection. I still can't cut myself. And they're like, oh, this is really powerful protection. It's really powerful. So. When you take it off, it's still gonna last for two to three hours. And I was like, oh, okay. So I take it off, keep it off. Keep it off for a few hours, wait until the evening, have dinner. And after the evening, I go down to Matar and Jong's house, the drummer. 
And if you're interested in studying Sterling Lee's drum kit, then we've got a course with him on the World Music Method site. And I go down to his house, and there's like, you know, there's about six or seven of them in his room just playing PlayStation. And I'm like, all right, guys, get your biggest knife and sharpen it. And the guys, it's probably about, it's probably like, I don't know, foot long knife. There's this dude just sharpening it up on the rocks. I'm like, okay. All right, let's do it, come on. Comes up to me, cuts me on my arm. Obviously I bleed. I'm like, cool, thank you. I mean, who knows what these guys must have been thinking, especially the guys who didn't speak English there. They've just been, what is this madman doing? Then I put on the belt. I'm like, all right, come on, cut me again. Comes to me, does the same kind of cut. But this time, there's blood. And I'm like, oh. And everyone in the room is like, it's like, whoa, they can't believe that me wearing this knife protection, was a I was able to bleed. I was like, oh, see, it doesn't work. And they were like, no, no, it does work. You just can't test it. You have to believe. And I was like, no, but I need to, to believe. I need to know. And they're like, no, you just have to believe. I was like, no, that's not how my brain works. So the next morning, I go back to the witch doctor's hut. And I really give that knife a good sharpen. Cut myself, you know. Probably really dig in with a knife as well, just to be sure. And Ali Yu, my friend there. So I'm like, I'm like, yeah, don't worry about making the accident protection. But you know, thanks for your time. And Ali Yu is like, no. Even though he's just seen me cut myself with it on, he's like, this is really strong protection. I'll buy it off you for 20 pounds. I'm like, fine, no worries. All the, you know, no worries at all. So I'm heading back towards England, determined to be a West African car dealer, and that would be my that would be my future or my or my present, and that's how they make money. So, in the next episode, I'll tell you what happened when I followed through to the best of my abilities with the West African import. Uh, business scene. It didn't all go to plan, I'll tell you that. So, Senegal was great for me. What I learned in those few years musically will stay with me forever. What I learned about the relationship between the bass and the drums means that even if I'm like down at a funk or soul jam session, in England, the way I can lock in with people, the way I can anticipate, intuitively feel what they're going to do, it's very unlike how other people understand the instrument and the relationship with the groove. So I'm really thankful for everything that taught me. Because even if I'm not playing Senegalese music, it's still a part. It's still a part of me. If you want to learn. Senegalese bass style. A chapter of the African Bass Masterclass Deluxe was filmed in Senegal with Mata and Jong, Charlie Philly Sissoko, and some other great musicians. So check it out on worldmusicmethod.com. So thank you so much for watching. On drums, the Big Mac. Newell on guitar.